and welcome to our second Facebook Live Ready to Vote event. My name is Tabitha Safty, and I'm alongside Caitlin Park, who will be monitoring your comments all night and adding your voice to this conversation. Ready to Vote is designed to facilitate discussion around uh, voting. So tonight we have a group of South Carolina students who just got done watching the Republican gubernatorial race, and I'm eager to hear what you guys think. But first, I wanted to get it over to Caitlin Park uh, to talk a little bit about Facebook. Great. So thank you for joining our discussion with your comments and questions. We had a great question last night from Susan Deveni, who's actually holding a watch party tonight at USCL. So we wanted to start with her question this evening. What is the one thing you wish the next governor would focus on? My name is Jenna Schifferl, and I'm a student at the University of South Carolina. I think that one specific thing the upcoming governor should focus on is school safety, especially in light of recent events that have happened. I don't think that any student should fear for their lives when going to school, and I think that's one thing that a lot of people talk about, but we haven't seen a lot of real action on it, so that's one thing I would definitely like to see um, a focus on. Uh, I would also like to see a focus from these candidates in our schools. Uh, in addition to the importance of safety, the quality of education in our state has been talked about, but specific solutions haven't really been addressed. You know, there's been no discussion of gifted education programs. There's been very little discussion of how we're going to appropriate the money more effectively in rural districts. You know, we can talk about putting more money into schools, but which schools, how much money, and is it going to be used on textbooks, teachers, technology? These are the questions that we actually need to have answered. Uh, I'm Christian Compton, a uh, sophomore at USC. Uh, when it comes to tonight specifically, um, frankly, I would have liked to have seen the candidates focus a little more on uh, why we should vote for them versus why you shouldn't vote for the person standing next to them. Uh, you know, of course, I agree with you two about those, you know, education being a big issue and whatnot. Uh, and you know, I'd like to see focus on that, of course. But really, I just feel like there wasn't enough focus on the issues at all. Uh, it was more about, you know, track records and who voted for this, who's more this than that. You know, I would, I would like to see a shift towards the actual issues, uh, period. Uh, but education and, you know, school safety, uh, roads, things like that, those are all definitely big ones. But I was disappointed not to see more talk about those kinds of things. Hi, my name is Richard Dorman, Jr. Um, the biggest thing that I really wish they would have talked about tonight that, again, they didn't talk about yesterday and they did not talk about tonight uh, was the uh, rising cost of college. In the state of South Carolina, it is very expensive to go to college, not only just private college in institutions, but also public institutions. It's going to cost someone $27,000 a year to go to USC Columbia. Uh, and the Life Scholarship or even Palmetto Fellows do not even cover even a fraction of the amount of the cost for that. I was uh, looking um, on uh, some statistics on a CNBC article talked about how South Carolina ranks eighth in the nation in terms of um, students worse in the nation in terms of students graduating with um, debt at the, the average amount for a lot of them was uh, $30,000 in debt just getting out. And that's not something that a student can start on their feet on once they get out of college. And it's, the cost has only been going up and the scholarship amount has not been keeping up. It's just only gonna continue to get worse. Hi, I'm Vieira Harris, computer engineer major at Benedict College. One of the things that I would like to see our new governor do is to ensure that small businesses and minorities have access to receive capital and to be able to enhance their businesses and not stay stagnant. I also agree with the rest of you guys about education, ensuring that the affordable cost or the cost for education um, decreases and is more um, available for people to get that. And I also would like for the new governor to ensure that that everyone has quality education, all children, all women, men, whoever who, who's um, partaking in education to receive a good quality education. Thank you, I'm Will Galloway. I just graduated from Blythewood High School this morning and I'm also the student outreach coordinator for the South Carolina Federation of Young Republicans. And the thing that I'd like to see the next governor really focus on is ethical government. Because, you know, we talk a lot about education and we talk a lot about infrastructure, but until we have a return to ethical government, until we have checks and balances in state government, and until we, you know, start to look at 
a return to statesman leadership, at least in state politics, none of that other stuff is going to get done. And if it does even attempt to get done, it's not going to be done well. And so that's what I'd like to see the next governor do is, is find ways to make sure that our state government is accountable to the people and is ethical and trustworthy. Yeah, my name is Rivers Chadwick, and I'm graduating from South Aiken High this week. Uh, the biggest issue for me is more of a personal one, uh, as it is with everyone else here, I'm assuming. It's school safety. I'm going to school next to the Citadel, so I'll be a couple hours away from my little sister, and it terrifies me knowing that there's nothing I can, I can do personally to ensure her safety. And I'd like to know what uh, these, these uh, candidates can do to promise me and ensure her safety in, at school. Hello, I'm Michael Fields. I'm a graduating senior at Benedict College. One thing I would like for the candidates to talk about is the equal distribution of money. Uh, I don't believe we necessarily have an issue with the funds. I believe we have an issue with distributing money and where is, is the money actually going. Uh, we look at the rural areas and that they are lacking in a lot of things and I believe it's one of those things is out of sight, out of mind. So the fact that a lot of us don't see it is the fact that it's not really a big deal. So how are you going to uh, equally distribute or what is your plan of action to make sure all funds are equally allocated to the right and uh, school districts in the rural areas that are not always seen, such as like Richland County, Beaufort County, Charleston, such, you know, so how are they going to equally distribute the money and make sure that kids are actually getting a fair chance at education and getting a fair opportunity? All right, so um, I'm eager to find out what, um, what did you guys think of tonight's debate? What? I thought it was uh, it, it was it was very intriguing. Um, I believe they talked about uh, some different issues, but I I don't think they got to the root of it all. I believe, like he, I believe one of you said they was more so focused on each other's mistakes instead of focused on the plan of action they would take to uh, how would they what the plan of action they would take if in office. I feel that they spent a lot of time, just like last night, <laughs> the Democrats did, uh, nitpicking each other on things they did do or things they don't do. And I believe just, it, it, to me, it's, it's, it's unfair, but just, it was, it was, I guess, a little better tonight. Well, uh, I, I have to agree. There was definitely a lot of, um, uh, going back and forth and hitting on people's records and not necessarily talking about um, the actual issues at hand, but I actually think that it was actually a lot worse than that because you had, <laughs> you had uh, especially Templeton and McMaster going at it, uh, just back and forth and everything. And I'm just sitting here and I just wanted to see what you would do as governor and what you're going to do to fix this state. You know, and one of the biggest issues that we're having right now in, in not only the state, but in this nation is uh, not being able to come together when it comes to getting stuff done. If you're in a government position, you're the one who's supposed to be helping us, the people, become better, make our lives better, make things easier for us. You're not, we don't care who's the one who's going to do it at the end of the day, just as long as it gets done right. So I just... I mean, I understand that some of the points were important, but a lot of it was unnecessary. Just need to move on. Let's focus on the issues. Um, I wouldn't, I, maybe this is in later, but if it is, stop me. But um, yeah, sorry. But so I wanted to call attention to one part I thought was particularly disappointing. Um, I like the question about uh, asking, you know, how you would be independent of President Trump as governor. I thought that was an important one. Um, sometimes I feel like it's, you know, especially in your southeastern, you know, states, uh, conservative candidates seem to just piggyback off of a Trump endorsement and ride that wave into office, um, you know, which whether or not that's good or bad is an entirely different point. I did not like, though, the, the candidate's response to that question whatsoever. None of them even, you know, did anything other than shower the sitting president with praise. Um, you know, for a minute, it honestly felt like a, a uh, sorry, a presidential campaign ad for Trump and his reelection. I didn't, there was nothing about South Carolina in there, you know, and, and the question was asked, you know, what has Donald Trump done for South Carolina? And I believe one of the responses was he gave South Carolinians hope. <laughs> 
I, yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, come on, really? Like, you know, I'm not trying to put down, you know, Donald Trump supporters, voters, or anything like that. I totally understand. But I feel like as if you're running for governor of South Carolina, you need to do a little better than just say, Donald Trump endorsed me, there's that. You need to actually step up to the plate and talk about what you're going to do for this state and what you're going to do for the people. Um, uh, comparing it to the debate last week, I actually liked there was a bit more interaction between the candidates. Uh, I do think it needs to be a bit more civil, uh, and we, we do see a lot of times in these debates the candidates go after very personal attacks. Uh, but it, it, the thing about this debate is about half of it was exactly the same as the debate last week. Candidates sticking to the same lines that they practiced a thousand times and making very little deviation. You know, it's nice to know candidates stick to what they stand for, but they need to say real ideas and actual things instead of just repeating the same lines over and over again, or else we're not going to know their policies, we're gonna, not going to know the differences between them at all. I completely agree with both Justin and Christian um, regarding the candidates' interactions with each other and as well as the content of what they were saying. I did hear a lot of the same facts kind of spewed out again tonight as I did last week in the debates. And additionally, I feel although I was a little underwhelmed by the responses, I was almost expecting it because this is what have we, we've been seeing in South Carolina politics is not a lot of real solutions as to how people think or how people are going to accomplish the things that they say they're going to do and it's a lot of talk so that's kind of what i saw again tonight well you know i think that there were some real solutions that were put out i think that john warren especially talked about a lot of real solutions and talked about some things in ways that have not been talked about in in this campaign until he entered the race i think that uh, governor mcmaster and lieutenant governor bryant also did a, a pretty good job of in, in a number of ways especially mcmaster with the prisons uh, introducing some solutions. I don't think that Mrs. Templeton did particularly well on that. If I heard buzzsaw once, I heard it a thousand times. And, you know, I will say that I don't necessarily think there's anything overtly wrong with correcting the record if another candidate is, is um, slandering you. I think, you know, I would like to see everyone stay above the fray like Yancey McGill did, but I don't necessarily think there's anything inherently wrong with setting the record straight when you are attacked. And, you know, ultimately it's a question of character. And if there's something out there that questions the character of another candidate, it's the rest of the field's responsibility to bring that to the voters' attention. It's great that you say that. Um, I agree that it is good to clear up your character and make sure that you want to clear the air about things that you have going on as far as misconsumptions um, about what people say. But if you're so clear and precise on saying what someone else is doing and about the corrupt character of other people, then your plan and your solution as far as what you're going to do for our state needs to be just as clear and precise when you're speaking. That's what the debate is about, isn't it? You're, you're qualified, you think you're qualified to be here, that's why you're here, so we don't want to know about, you know, your qualifications, that's why you're here. So we really want to know about what is your plan, and I think that's kind of everyone's solution or, you know, assumption if you're able to say, hey, this is wrong about someone else, or this is wrong about this situation, you should be able to bring forth a plan just as clear. Just uh, to remind everyone, uh, we are watching uh, the chat on uh, Facebook, so go ahead and add a, a little bit of your discussion to, to this uh, conversation here. Um, so we heard a little bit tonight about um, the prescription opioid drug problem we have. Um, the nation is in the midst of an opioid crisis. So what's happening in your schools, and um, did the candidates give you any food for thought tonight on that? Well, my concern when it comes to the opioid uh, epidemic would be, <clears throat> will we properly punish the people who's responsible for it? Uh, and uh, street crime, we penalize or we criminalize the drug dealers for selling crack cocaine, selling marijuana, but are we gonna start penalizing and charging these doctors that are responsible for this outrageous epidemic and are we just going to act oblivious to the fact that they're responsible for it and if we don't take action for it i believe it will it will be a disservice and unfair to uh this nation as, as citizens as law-abiding citizens to allow uh that to go under the rug and not take full responsibility for what they have done and caused to this point
I just wanted to say, I like when they talked about the database, um, you know, they were creating for, you know, opioid prescriptions and whatnot. I thought it was very scary that some of the candidates were saying that they would have gotten rid of that. Um, if anything, I feel like when you're presented with a crisis, like at, at the scale of the opioid epidemic is at this point, if you can honestly, you know, sit there and, and talk about dismantling, you know, not that this system is a solution by any stretch, but nevertheless, I do think it's a step in the right direction. And at least it's something that's working towards resolving the problem. You know, I really just don't like that, uh, you know, some people were able to, I believe it's two of the candidates were able to stand up there and say, you know, um, I would have gotten rid of, I would have done away with that. I don't think that's a good thing. Uh, you know, I understand privacy and whatnot, things like that are, are issues, uh, but when it comes down to it, you know, anything I think, uh, you know, that is definitely trying to address the opioid crisis is something that we should at least consider. We shouldn't just throw away with some rhetoric about, you know, this nanny government, I believe, was the phrase one candidate used to reject it. Uh, it's just nonsense, quite honestly. Uh, we also heard a lot about um, DOT and corruption, and I think someone even said something about draining the swamp here in Columbia. <laughs> what were your thoughts on that? I think that, you know, there is absolutely a lot of mismanagement at the DOT, and we're seeing road money being spent in areas that it doesn't need to be spent. And, you know, I, I appreciated uh, John Warren and Kevin Bryant and some of the others talking about how they would like to make it a cabinet position and have real accountability. We need to audit the DOT and figure out where the money is being spent before we start adding extra money to it. Like if someone asks you to borrow $100, you're going to ask them how are they going to spend it. And if you loan it to, if they come back the next week, you're going to ask how they spend the last $100. And I, I, I think we need to start doing that and having that same level of accountability and having a needs based system. And I think then, you know, I'm glad that at least one of the candidates has been talking about a needs-based system for the roads and making sure that that road money gets to rural areas that need it the most and not just Columbia and Greenville. Well, you definitely need to hold them accountable. Uh, you need to start taking the government out of most of these projects because it slows it down. The bureaucracy really slows it down. There's been a road project on the main road to my high school, Silver Bluff, that's been going on for over two years just uh, celebrated the two anniversary of about a month ago. Uh, <laughs> and it really slows it down. You need to make this an accountable position because as voters, we can't hold anyone accountable when we have stuff like this where I am being impeded in my day-to-day -day life on these roads and there's nothing I can do about it to hold anyone accountable because I can't vote anyone out or vote anyone in. We have to make, the, make sure that we can hold these people accountable. Yeah, I, I know most of the candidates were saying that they think DOT should be a cabinet level position, that it should be something controlled by the executive, but the fact of the matter is that that's up to the legislature. The legislature controls DOT right now, and I believe there's a bill right now to put DOT under the executive, but that's something the legislature is going to have to pass. The governor can't do that single-handedly, and not a single one of the candidates has talked about how they're going to work with the legislature to get these bills passed. Most of them have called the legislature corrupt, which undoubtedly it is. But none of them have, have pointed to specific people they're willing to work with. None of them have indicated they're willing to work with people on the opposite side of the aisle to get bills passed in the legislature. So uh, to be honest, it's just a lot of talk about fixing the roads that a lot of us have been hearing since we were little kids. And none of it's changed. There have been two that have, uh, who have addressed how they would do it. Uh, Bryant and Warren have both put forward a plan for that. And you know they were both Bryant and Warren, I'll be really quick on this, but they've both talked about how they would bring the message to the people and how they would you know, really use a full scale, use all the, uh, the advantages that the governor's office has to work with the legislators who are willing to work with them to get that done. I, I think it goes back to even checks and balances. Uh, I believe they appoint these people and just relinquish all the power to them and say, you deal with it. And they don't go back and say, or over the period of time, are they actually fulfilling the need that you was put in office for? So I think it goes back to making sure that even from the head, because everything flows from the head on down, making sure from the head that they're actually checking these people, that they put in office for these reasons, and making sure they actually uh, take action to the plans that they have been put in office to do, such as the roles. Are they effectively 
uh, distributing the funds to make sure those bridges in rural areas or those roads in rural areas are actually being fixed. And I just go back to the same thing. I believe it's just one of those things, is if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. So the fact that if I can't see it and if it's really not affecting me, I'm not really concerned about it. So it just goes back to checks and balances. Okay. You know, last night um, I asked some of you that were here last night um, to talk a little bit about civility in elections and what specifically candidates can do to create a more positive tone around elections. But um, tonight I want to ask something about uh, what individuals and maybe even members of the media can do to help create that positive tone. Well, it's our duty as citizens to respect everyone's opinions. I remember there was a, an attack on a, a teenage Republican who's working on a Timbaland campaign, by the way, the Master campaign, which is mm -hmm. disgusting. It's it's hard enough as it is for younger people to get involved in politics, and we have people that immediately discredit and immediately feel like they have to disagree with everything you say just because you identify yourself with a certain candidate or a certain party. Uh, you, you won't get anywhere with that. You have to have civil discourse and discuss policies and issues and other stuff to actually get somewhere. Yeah, uh, you, you just made a wonderful point, actually. Um, you know, I think if you look at it, there's all kinds of research that shows polarization in politics has gotten way worse. More and more people on one side of the aisle think the other is an enemy, you know, a threat to their existence rather than just somebody they disagree with. Uh, you know, those sorts of things are definitely major problems. Um, and I think acknowledging them is a big step. Uh, at, at the individual level, though, I think that the best way uh, that we can handle, you know, uh, you know, try to tackle the issue of incivility, which has, it definitely has plagued modern politics. Go look at any controversial news article on Facebook and click view comments. <laughs> yeah, make sure you have a box of tissues <laughs> next to you for it because it's very sad. But, uh, you know, it, it's just not, the, the image of our modern American political discourse has been hijacked by negativity and hatred, you know, um, and as individuals, I think the best thing we can do is, is you know, uh, make it something, a principle we uphold to, you know, be able to disagree with people without hating them. You know, be able to disagree with people without thinking, wow, you know, what an idiot, or you know, that person, <laughs> you know, whatever, but be able to disagree with people respectfully and, you know, understand that you're gonna have different approaches to the same problem. That's the way America works. I mean, it's been going this way for, you know, however many years now, and that's sad that I can't say the exact, what is it, like 200 years or something? Anyways, um, but, you know, point being, you know, it, it's been built on the idea that you have to work with people who don't agree with you. It's just that simple. That's modern adult life. You can't just say, anyone who thinks this is this, and I'm not going to work with them. You have to be willing to reach across the aisle, and I think that's something that, uh, you know, if you as an individual never, you know, even when someone's attacking you personally, you know, hold yourself higher than them, and I feel like that would go a long way if, if people, you know, tried to do that. One thought that I've got on, or a couple thoughts I've got on this is, one, there's such an obsession, especially in the world of social media politics, with the politics of trolling others and the politics of going viral. And people, in order to achieve those ends, are going to more and more outlandish means. And, and we as individuals need to stop doing that. We need to actually focus on substance and stop worrying about trolling other people. We need, and you know, one thing that for me has been really beneficial this year is I've gotten to meet one of my best friends is uh, a young woman by the name of Lauren McDowell, who is a feminist Democrat, and I'm a very conservative Republican. And, you know, there's actually a neat article that I encourage you to look up on the AP News that's about our friendship. Um, and I, didn't, I just encourage people to go out of their way to make friends with people who disagree with them. And friendships like that will teach you that just because someone disagrees with you doesn't mean that they disagree with your end. Everybody wants to have a better life for themselves and for their community. They have different ways of going about that. But we have to make an effort in our lives to... Um, to, to understand that. And you asked about the media. I think the media can stop focusing on these you know, blatant personal attacks and the uh, disregard for the truth that seems to be the hallmark of, uh, of modern politics and go back to focusing on issues and on uh, statesmanlike leadership. I, have to, I agree um, completely with you, Will. And I have read that article, and that is an amazing article. You two are awesome. I 
can't wait to see the great things that y'all do for the state. Um, one thing that I, I myself am, am a Democrat. I uh, am the outgoing president of Young Democrats at High School. And one thing that I, I try to do whenever I, I talk to conservatives from the other side of the aisle is I automatically assume that they know what they're talking about, that they, they've done their research, they have, they are convinced that what they have read um, is a viable solution that could benefit the people of our state. Now, I might have my criticism of that specific policy belief, but, you know, that's, that's normal. And by going in and automatically assuming that, you know, they are, they know what they're talking about, then you're not thinking about them as an idiot. You're not thinking about them as someone who's just a loud mouth. You're thinking about them as an intelligent person who, just like you, wants to make this state better. You know, I, another group of uh, one conservative, one liberal, who were completely different sides of the aisle that I like to think about are uh, Justices uh, Scalia and uh, Ginsburg. You know, best friends, best of friends, most unlikely of friends in many, many respects, but they both respected each other as having evidence to back their side. They may not have agreed with each other's beliefs, but they thought of each other as people who knew what they were talking about. And I believe that's what we need to start doing once more so we can finally get started on some good bipartisan solutions. And to chime in, it, if this, the end goal or the primary goal is to do what's best for the people, what's best for the state, the nation, the organization, to see all the chaos and dysfunction that goes on between conversations have between different um, beliefs, policies, or whatever the case may be, if the primary goal is to do what's best for the state of South Carolina or whatever you're a part of, it doesn't matter, it shouldn't matter what other views or preferences that someone else has. If the, if the primary goal is to do what's best for the people, why is that not the goal? So that goes to the motive and the intent. If you cannot hear someone else's perspective or someone else's views, or you think your view is higher than someone else, what is your motive and what is your intent as to why you can't understand what someone else is saying, regardless if you disagree or agree or not? And I think that's the number one question that I have for politicians, especially going on nowadays, that there's so much chaos and in confusion off of one primary goal in doing what is best for the people. I read a quote the other day, and this will be really quick, but it was uh, Jack Kemp, who was a former congressman and cabinet official, said that you serve your party best by serving your country first. And I think that's something that everyone on the stage tonight and the stage last night and who's thinking about running office or running for office or holding office would do well to remember. And I believe we have a, a comment. Um, we do. Um, thank you all for letting us know that you are listening and following our discussion tonight. Um, user Jason Cannon asks, and we've touched on this a bit tonight, but um, in a little bit more of a deliberate way, can a candidate compromise too much? I would say it. Candidates can compromise too much in the sense that they can compromise their values. They can change who they are in order to win elections. You know, sometimes we'll hear a candidate say one thing in a primary. We'll hear them say an entirely different thing in a general, and then they'll do a third different thing when they're actually elected. Uh, that's the kind of compromise we can't afford. The com kind of compromise we need, though, is candidates who are willing to reach across the aisle to find common sense solutions. You know, there, there are a lot of issues that sides just completely disagree on. You know, abortion, the Second Amendment, there are things that Democrats and Republicans have very little ground to stand on together, but there are those points, and those are the points that are talked about the least. Uh, those are the points that we really need to be talking about the most. Uh, and briefly, because uh, this actually relates to the last question as well, uh, the media ha has been polarizing these issues more than ever before. You know, you'll turn on one sh news channel and you hear one viewpoint, and another news channel you hear an entirely different viewpoint. That's not how news is supposed to work. Uh, you're supposed to be able to hear what happened and see the outcomes and not hear 90% opinion and 10% fact. So I think once that changes, we'll start seeing better candidates and people who are more informed about politics. Yeah, I mean, I agree with him. You know, obviously, uh, compromise in the sense of compromising your values, that's a no-no. But, uh, but honestly, I do think that, you know, while I, you know, this isn't backtracking my previous answer, I definitely think people should work together. You have to understand, though, at the same time that some issues, the answer is not always the middle of the road. 
you know, the, you know, the let's take the most extreme left and the most extreme right, somewhere in the middle has got to be the answer. That sort of centrism is, is also not always the answer. It's not a one size fits all solution. Otherwise, every problem in the United States would be, you know, resolved overnight, quite honestly. <laughs> um, and that's not to say that you were, you know, suggesting that or anybody suggested that, but that's, that's a common narrative I hear. Um, and I just want to say that it is possible for a candidate to compromise too much, you know. I mean, I'm not saying if, if you believe it should be this way, you know, you can still believe it should be that way without necessarily, uh, you know, while still acknowledging somebody else's approach being legitimate and valid. Um, you know, and then of course you guys can, you know, two, two politicians who disagree uh, can work like civil, civilized adults to, you know, decide how they're going to handle it. I mean, so, so yeah, people can compromise too much, but, uh, you know, that not, they can still work together. They're not mutually exclusive. I think even when it comes to compromise, you have to look at the what and the why. Like, and what issues are you compromising? As a leader, I believe you have to be selfless. Uh, the reason you should be running it shouldn't be for self-gain. It should be for the gain of society. And I believe a lot of times we see in this 21st century, and not even just 21st century, even throughout history, uh, that a lot of times uh, politicians run not for the greater good of society, but for the greater good of their own self or their own family. So I believe when it comes to compromise, we have to look at what are you compromising and why are you compromising? And is the compromise actually benefiting you or is the compromise actually benefiting society as a whole, as a bigger picture? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, this has been a great conversation tonight, uh, everyone. I want to thank you guys for joining us. And I want to thank everyone out there for um, adding in your comments. And feel free to, to comment on our discussion um, down the road. And, We'll pay attention. Um, thanks for watching.